Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Pantheon Resources PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your questions at any time and press send. Given the significant attendance on today's call, the company will not be able to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and we'll publish those responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. And as usual, I'm sure the company would be most grateful for your participation. And I'd now like to hand over to Executive Chairman David Hobbs. Good afternoon. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. And good afternoon, good morning and good whatever. Uh, depending on where you're joining from. Thank you uh, for spending the time with us. Um, before we uh, kick off, uh, it's important uh, that we uh, share the disclaimer, give you an opportunity to read it uh, maybe later. Uh, the presentation has been posted to the website, so it's all there. Um, so on with business. Uh, today, we're going to be sharing six things with you. Uh, first, we're going to tell you about the, the first of two independent expert reports covering the two horizons within the Apoon field um, that have so far been uh, flow tested successfully uh, are going to, one, be delivered uh, imminently from Lee Keeling and Associates on the Alcade zone, and the second from Corley Gillespie uh, on the top sets, uh, the Western top sets in the Apoon field, uh, again, expected shortly, but um, we know that the Lee Keeling one is, is imminent. Uh, these estimates will not be contingent on economics uh, because we've asked them to include an economic analysis in their work. We will address the contingency on marketability uh, in, do, in the so far as we have a legitimate path to gain access to the Trans-Alaska pipeline system and in due course, the in-state phase of the Alaska LNG project pipeline to Nikiski, should that project proceed. Alternatively, We've investigated the injectability of the gas back into the top set reservoirs for storage and found that that is feasible. The second thing we're going to share is the most recent resource estimates from Netherlands Sewell and Associates updating their report on Kodiak to include the new updip acreage acquired in the recent bidding round. This is going to confirm a best estimate of 1.2 billion barrels of marketable liquids and around 5.5 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Third, we're going to share the results of SLB's dynamic modeling of the Apoon top sets at the Pipeline State 1 location, which is calibrated to the whole core gathered in that well by Arco and reflects the results of the recompletion and flow tests of the top sets in the LK2 well. This is going to demonstrate EUR's per well, expected ultimate recoveries per well of 3.7 million barrels of marketable liquids and 8 billion cubic feet of gas. And that's consistent with Pantheon's own internal work on type curves for each of our main reservoirs. It gives us confidence that our methodology and analysis are robust and results in a planning basis for the Apoon top sets of 3.5 million barrels of marketable liquids per well. Using the same methodology, we've estimated type curves for the Kodiak reservoir, both at the Theta West uh, number one well location where our planning basis is for the time being 3.65 million barrels of uh, marketable liquids, and also at an updip planning, uh, uh, updip uh, appraisal location, uh, where, as you'll recall, there's a reduced depth of burial, um, and that has a planning basis of 4.56 million barrels per well expected ultimate recovery. So the analysis that we'll be sharing with you supports our belief that Kodiak's resources can be developed economically. The pre-tax economics on each of these wells uh, type curves uh, is, has been run at between 60 and $90 per barrel of ANS, and we'll be sharing with you, but the headline is that in all circumstances, they, individual wells on a marginal basis deliver more than 100% rates of return. The fourth thing we're going to share with you is the work we've done on the eastern top sets of Apoon. That's the next cycle of top sets across which we expect to exhibit conventional reservoir characteristics, even on a par with the Pika Horseshoe development. And with best estimates of prospective resources of more than 600 million barrels of marketable liquids. Bob will be going into more detail on that. The fifth thing we're going to explain to you is the importance of the announcement that we in AGDC agreed two weeks ago about the proposed agreement on natural gas and how it ties into our funding strategy. I'm going to hold my hands up figuratively rather than literally, 
and say we could have done a better job and been more explicit about the link between the two. We'll explain why the pipeline project does not rely upon the LNG export plan or the participation of other uh, sellers of gas and how it will support potential non-equity funding of Pantheon's Apun and Kodiak developments. The final thing and sixth is we're going to explain the basis on which we disclose the helium potential identified in the Kodiak field. It lies between two radioactive shales, the HRZ and the HU. And while there can be no guarantees that this helium will be present in sufficient quantities to make it commercially extractable, Pantheon is taking steps to ensure the opportunity to refine the concentrated helium stream that would constitute the gaseous residues from an LNG plant if one were built. The reason we haven't disclosed it previously is that without any way of accessing uh, helium and, and doing anything other than uh, producing, uh, uh, reinjecting natural gas meant that it had no commercial significance. But we're now obliged to mention it as part of uh, what we're sharing with you. Uh, we're doing everything we can to accelerate vendor pro, uh, financing. Uh, we're still uh, in discussions with one large contractor uh, and we hope to be able to share uh, information with you in due course uh, and certainly uh, to meet our commitment to lay out the full shape of our funding strategy by the end of the second quarter of this year. At the end, we're going to try and answer uh, all the questions that we legitimately can either uh, or have time for. Just a reminder of the two major fields. Uh, Apun constitutes everything above the Hugh Shale and below the Decca D. Uh, there are resources included for it and, and we are doing development planning on the top sets, the shelf margin, uh, deltaic uh, horizons as was, and on the alcade zone. It does not include anything for the upper and lower uh, uh, slope fans. Secondly, Kodiak constitutes everything between the HRZ um, and the Hue, and uh, that only includes the lower basin floor fan. It does not currently include resources for the upper basin floor fan and the Kaparic uh, discovery that was made in the uh, Talitha well, again, not included in any, in any resource estimate. So hopefully that clarifies for everyone what we're talking about. When we talk about Apun, we're talking about the top sets, the Alcade zone, and we're talking about Kodiak, the lower basin floor fan. With that, I'm going to hand over to Jay. Okay, so we have two independent expert reports that we've, we've uh, talked about. Uh, Kali Gillespie and Associates work is underway on the Apun field, as David said, and Lee Keeling and Associates, who did an original uh, independent expert report on the Alcade zone back in January of 2020, uh, has reworked uh, what they've done before with new data, and we imminently expect that to come. We have also, as David said, use the SLV modeling, their dynamic modeling, and our own internal modeling to look at type well curves. And uh, we've done this on a single well basis uh, for the Apun field top sets. Uh, and we'll show you a, a layer cake model later in the presentation on that. Uh, we have used 3.5 million barrels uh, EUR where the SLB model was 3.7 million barrels expected. The Kodiak Theta West has a little better uh, KH in it, so it's a slightly better uh, EUR of 3.65 million barrels. And the Kodiak Updip that we've talked extensively about and we're expecting uh, conventional type reservoirs there, and Bob will talk a lot more about that later we have 4.56 million barrels of EURs. All of these wells have in excess of 100% internal rates of return. Now here on the right-hand side, you can see the actual layer cake model that SLB did for the single well uh, SMD zone type well. And you can see the green, the yellow, and the red is layered in and that is exactly emulates what the reservoir looks like. We have some high permeability and porosity zones, some that are average and some that are poor, and they are stratified throughout uh, the 
the height of, of the reservoir. That is exactly what SLB modeled. We drilled it. They did it with a 10,000 foot lateral. You can see the frack height and lengths uh, that, uh, that we've assumed with a cluster efficiency of 80%. And we have capped liquid rates. So that's both oil and water at 5,000 stock tank barrels a day. And we've capped the gas rate at 10,000 MCF per day. You can see they did uh, Monte Carlo analysis with the oil EURs uh, having a range of 1.1 to 5.6 and the NGLs 0.5 to 1.3 with gas basically 5 BCF to 14 BCF. But the best case yields 2.9 million stock tank barrels of, of oil and 800,000 stock tank barrels of gas. I mean, of uh, condensates and liquids and eight BCF of gas. And what, well, this is reasonably conservative because we use 95 barrels per MCF of, conden of condensate and NGLs, which was well below the actual liquid yield that we had seen for the SMD test. Now, here are the actual IRRs and NPVs for those wells based on the EURs and at an ANS price of 60, 70, 80, and 90. And you can see the, the assumptions down below. We have 750 in transportation. We've got one injection well for every three producing wells. We assume $17 million for a production well and $15 million for an injection well, and then $50 million for a pad, including facilities. And we have state profits uh, in. This is without federal income tax. But you can see the NPVs and the, IR, and the IRRs obviously are greater than 100, but the NPVs are incredible for uh, these investments. So when you add the uh, the well cost for the injectors and the cost per uh, <clears throat> well per pad, you've got one to one to six to one in uh, NPV to investment on the mid case, the 365, something a little less than that for our Apun top sets. And you can see over on the right-hand side, the Kodiak updip, incredible return on those wells. These are hugely economic wells under any scenario, $60 a barrel ANS, and we, we know that ANS trades for something close to Brent. The Apun Field, the Eastern Top Sets. I'm going to turn it over to Bob to talk you through our best estimate of the uh, Apun Field Eastern Top Sets uh, reservoirs. Hello, everyone, and Hello, thanks everyone. for uh, joining the uh, um, this uh, presentation and the in this webinar. Um, so yes, I'm first I'm going to take you through uh, our recent evaluation of the Eastern top set. And you can see now that our best estimates are circa 600 million barrels of marketable liquids recoverable. That's up from the 300 plus million that we were looking at when we were uh, when we first discussed this with you in the past. So Slide here, we're going to look at the total Apun field. And um, when we look at the total Apun field, which includes the Western top sets uh, around Pipeline State, the Apun uh, anomaly, and the acreage that we just picked up in the lease sale, which is, let me mark this up for you. Uh, so right here is what we picked up in the lease sale. Uh, that's the Apun uh, top set on the east. 
our total sort of best uh, estimate of contingent and prospective resources over a billion barrels of marketable liquids. That is a that number there is broken out uh, in the West. We've we've published in the past about 400 million barrels. Uh, the Apum zone of interest. Uh, we have an IER of about 76 million barrels, and the new the new uh, uh, resource estimate on the Apum top set in the east uh, of 600 million. Uh, we mapped this uh, recently. We've got multiple targets. Our geologic chance of success, which I know we we were continually asked, we have a we hit this at about 70 percent chance of success. When you when you look at the whole Apum infrastructure or the Apum field, uh, what is important about this is, of course, that it's uh, it, it's location next to the pipeline, which is, let me mark that in here. That's the pipeline, right? Oops, sorry. That's the pipeline right there. And the Hall Road, which is sitting right there. All of that it means we're close to infrastructure and we are, you know, it's, it's, easily developed, uh, do all that. So get rid of that. And the important part of this is on the optimum top set is that this is a conventional reservoir. It's younger, shallower than the optimum top sets that we've in, uh, in, intersected at pipeline state. We have sidewall cores at Pipeline State that indicate that the reservoir quality is going to be something of between 20 to 25 percent in 5 to 35 millidarcies. This is a very good conventional reservoir in the range of what the Nanashuk looks like to the west of us. So, so what does it look like? This is seismic line through it. Uh, the highlights on this line for for all of you out there is, of course, that we've tested oil uh, here in the top sets uh, at uh, Talitha. We got some oil out of it. We know we have oil at Pipeline State. Uh, and over here is what we're going for in uh, the to, to the east. It is shallower. It's younger. There are sidewall cores in the pipeline state that have ranges anywhere from 22% porosity. This is this is the information over here. This is actual sidewall core data that anywhere from 22% porosity up to 34% porosity in sidewall cores. And we have a sidewall core that has permeabilities of 35 millidarcies. This is, again, this is a very much uh, conventional reservoir. And remember, we always do uh, the what we call the seismic attribute analysis. This is the work done by Roger Young and his team at eSize. And every single time when we've uh, tested uh, using this uh, using this approach, we have found light oil. The, the multiple targets that you see in the Apun top set in the east there, uh, all those things light up and are telling us that we have light oil in, in those reservoirs. The, the other thing is, is our proposed test, which is the Megres location, which is right there. That well, we believe we can drill it from west of the Dalton Highway we have a location that is already permitted and where we can drill, uh, we could spud it there and test uh, across the, uh, the Sag River and go in and test these, uh, these zones here. So we're going to hit, we're going to try, we're going to hit all the targets that we can, um, that we can map in with this one well. Of course, I want to emphasize that this is just the top set um, uh, resource number. We have a, uh, a uh, identified other reservoirs 
and uh, but we have not done the volumetrics on that. Here's the actual numbers. Um, and on the map, the different reservoirs labeled uh, TS1, 2, 3, uh, uh, those are each of, the, each of those zones have been mapped. And you can see the acreage outlines on that. And the total estimate on this is 609 million barrels uh, of recoverable uh, liquids. And net to us, it would be about 527 million barrels. That's after uh, taking out all the, the uh, revenue uh, for, for the state. So next. Now on to Netherlands and Sewell. Netherlands and Sewell, as we announced yesterday, came up with a new upgrade uh, resource analysis on the Kodiak field. And that upgrade is to 1.2 billion barrels of marketable liquids. This is a contingent to C number and uh, includes uh, all the leases that are uh, that we've acquired um, in the last lease sale. Again, this is the NSAI disclaimer. You can you know, read that at your convenience. And this is the actual table uh, that they've put out. The, the, the numbers, I, I, I can only say they speak for themselves. It's you know 1.2 billion barrels. Their best case C2 estimate is 1.2 billion barrels of marketable liquids, oil, natural gas, uh, and condensate, and 5 TCF of, of, of gas. On the high side, which is, is which is important to look at, it's 2.8 billion barrels of marketable liquids and 11 TCF of gas. That's a 40% increase on what we what we had in our previous estimate, and that is because so these numbers have moved because what we've been able to identify and what they've concurred is that as we move up dip, less Dmax. We are going to in, we're going to encounter better reservoirs, and there's a portion of these reservoirs that are going to be conventional reservoirs. And conventional is just usually defined as having 0.1 milliDarcy's or better. Here's the map that shows the outline of where NSAI have mapped what they call Kodiak up dip which is where the porosities are 12% and more importantly, where the permeabilities, the average porosities are 12% and average permeabilities are 0.1 millidarcy. Again, I wanna emphasize those numbers are average. That means, that means we can expect to see better than that um, in, in this portion of the field. That, that up dip, which it starts sort of right here, at that marker right here and goes up dip in that direction over here. All of that, that's over 40,000 acres of reservoir that would be considered having the average pro an average of being considered a conventional reservoir. Why is that important? It's important because as Jay showed, we're gonna get better EURs. We're also gonna get much higher recovery. As a matter of fact, we we in that in that area up dip there, we are almost double the recovery factors that we have um, around Theta West, which means that you know how we would develop this and what our EURs are 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 significantly improved. This is the actual numbers that they used. So um, one of the things you'll see here is the reference to tarn and meltwater, which was the analog that we thought and they agreed was the closest analog to uh, what we have at, uh, at Kodiak. Um, they've modified uh, some of the tarn numbers be because of slightly different Dmax, but in here, just to highlight um, our best case recovery factor 
is about 15%. It was 7% here. We can move this. We actually believe that this is the recovery factor on uh, we is the recovery factor that we see here in the high case is about 30%. So what's important here is when you look at this is we have 1.2 billion barrels already. That's a that's a massive discovery of uh, you, you know for just from the liquids point of view. But there's a potential to move that to the 2.8 billion by our appraisal program, the wells that we drill, and that we can show that we have the higher porosities and higher permeabilities that would be associated with moving up dip. In other words, the greater than 0.1 millidarcies and understanding the distribution of porosities and permeabilities that are greater than that, we'll be able to move uh, our numbers from the 1.2 to the 2.8. So with that, I'm going to turn that back over to Jay and to David. Natural gas. Um, thanks a lot for uh, whoever just remembered to unmute me. Um, so natural gas. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Bob, for, for handing on. Uh, we announced uh, um, a few weeks ago that we were in discussion and, and uh, Frank Richards, the president of AGDC, um, uh, included a quote in our uh, press release. Um, we're going to talk about the form of the proposed agreement um, and why we believe that that is the underpinning for substantial uh, non-equity funding uh, uh, capacity. Uh, and we're going to explain to you why the pipeline doesn't require the LNG project to move ahead. There's an in-state phase first, and finally, we'll we'll talk a little bit about um, the helium uh, opportunity. The proposal that we are discussing um, is to provide uh, up to 500 million cubic feet per day of methane at a price up to a uh, dollar per million British thermal units um, at the exit of the Apun facility so that that would be uh, no capital cost to us. Uh, it would simply be a choice between are we re-injecting that gas uh, or is the exit from the compressors putting the gas into uh, the pipeline. The uh, $1 is obviously a base price. It gets escalated with inflation uh, uh, or an appropriate package of, of escalators uh, to take account of, of general price rises in the economy. Um, and the uh, terms on which uh, we were, were agreeing it create the uh, opportunity for helium that may or may not um, end up being produced along with the gas. Of course, there won't be any helium in the uh, Apun gas that is the first gas coming into the system. Um, if there were helium, it would only be in Kodiak gas, uh, which would be more aligned with the time frame in which uh, an LNG project might be added to the initial in-state phase. That in-state phase is for a 42-inch pipeline. It's the pipeline that has already been permitted, as we'll, we'll come through to talk about, um, and supported by federal loan guarantees um, with an estimated cost, original uh, estimated cost of just under $11 billion, uh, rather than the full cost of the project, which was estimated at $45, $46 billion. Um, that, uh, uh, if we had a take or pay contract for a minimum of 20 years, um, then if you take the uh, present value of the post-tax cash flows from that and discount it um, uh, and take a 50% haircut for the for any lender's cover ratio, provides uh, up to $250 million worth of uh, uh, debt financing capacity. Um, obviously, that is debt that can be drawn uh, for the development of the uh, wells that will produce the gas, which is the same as the, uh, the wells that will produce the oil. Um, and uh, will be drawable from FID on the project. Uh, we're actively talking with the state about ways in which we can make the gas cheaper still to them um, without damaging the ability to support the financing capacity um, and looking for mutual benefit uh, on that. Uh, but the key thing is that the uh, gas commercialization, taking what would otherwise have been uh, a liability for us in terms of 
uh, incurring additional costs throughout the life of the assets for gas reinjection. Um, and it's gas reinjection for storage. It's not actually terribly important to the recovery of oil and gas in the primary recovery stage because that's the expansion of gas in the reservoir forcing the oil out. Um, uh, and if you don't allow that pressure to uh, uh, to drop and, and for the gas to expand, then you don't get the primary recovery. So it's about gas storage uh, for the long term and, and for preserving that resource for, for the benefit of the state in the long term. Um, there can't be any guarantee, as, as we said at the time, uh, that we'll conclude agreements, but I can say that we are uh, in, in detailed negotiations um, and over the coming uh, weeks and, and couple of months, uh, you'll be hearing more about that. But this is a key underpinning of our ability to mobilize non-equity capital to support the development, which is the lion's share of the costs um, that we talked about as being required uh, to get us through to cash flow break even and, and financial self-sufficiency. The uh, gas pipeline, uh, the 800 mile uh, pipeline has uh, an LNG export permit. It has its right of way and the major environmental permits already granted and it benefits from a 60% federal loan guarantee um, uh, in addition. So the remaining cost of that pipeline, um, say in the order of $5 billion, uh, is supported by the uh, send or pay obligations of the shippers of gas through that pipeline, which is supported by the ultimate purchases of the gas. And the state is very committed. You heard uh, Gunner, uh, Governor Dunleavy at Sierra Week, and, and you've heard Frank Richards, and you've heard other uh, key um, stakeholders in Alaska talking about their commitment to finding a way of moving forward for the in, for sure for the initial in-state um, uh, portion of uh, the project. And of course, having the pipeline built uh, enhances the um, attractiveness and economics of a subsequent LNG development. And that's where, if we are uh, lucky enough that the LNG development goes ahead, we find ourselves in a position where there's an opportunity to uh, commercialize helium should that prove up in, in uh, appraisal. Uh, AHS, you'll remember they're the people who have done all of the analytics on the uh, cuttings from our wells. Uh, they take gas samples and in the isotubes um, found concentrations of helium. We don't know yet what those specifically mean, but we do know now that it's worth being very uh, deliberate and having a specific protocol for gathering uh, gases in the isotubes from the appraisal wells we talked about for the western extent of Kodiak. Uh, and if that proves up, then indeed helium could be a very nice addition. It doesn't form any part of our current investment case. It does, however, make sure that the state is very aligned with us in wanting the development to move forward because it's an option to extract more value from the state's uh, natural resources. Um, I mentioned uh, in, uh, in my introduction that in terms of vendor financing, we're down to a single large service company that we're negotiating with. Um, the, uh, we talked previously about being in negotiations with two. Um, we've homed in on, on the one that we think is the best option. Um, and uh, we will doubtless uh, be in a position to announce something uh, in the time frame we originally talked about. Uh, but uh, as I said at the start, I, I hold my hands up. We should have been more specific when we uh, told you about the um, gas uh, negotiations. Uh, that is a core part uh, of our funding strategy. It always was. We talked about um, off-taker financing and vendor financing and some combination uh, of, of the two. We talked about how if everything came off, it might exceed the uh, 120 to $150 million. Um, that is still the case, uh, even if the makeup of that is different than we might have imagined at the start of discussions. And of course, once we've moved forward and got further appraisal, um, there are no reasons to expect that we can't uh, reopen discussions with people that we parked in the short term um, because they had concerns or we had concerns about the acceptability of terms or the attractiveness of the opportunity. So I want to summarize in the end, our strategy remains unchanged. Uh, it is to achieve sustainable market recognition of five to $10 per barrel by the end of 2028 um, and that's the time frame in which we expect to be getting to FID on, on Kodiak. Uh, hopefully we'll have uh, been uh, able to get Apun up and, and producing 
uh, it's sufficient to deliver uh, cash flow for funding uh, the continuing capex. Um, but to get to the point at which we're cash flow uh, self-sustaining, uh, still the same numbers as we shared with you at the end of last year, uh, 24 wells required uh, in the initial top sets. Uh, we anticipate from two initial pads um, and maybe a third just being added uh, as we get to that number uh, and uh, delivering at least 20,000 barrels a day of liquids into the pipeline. Um, uh, just to remind you and to reiterate, uh, we've had the, uh, uh, the Netherlands Sewell updated report. We've had SLB's um, single well modeling, and they're now working on the full field uh, modeling uh, uh, to support RFID and, and regulatory uh, um, applications. Uh, and uh, we're expecting the uh, Apun uh, Alcade zone estimate imminently. Uh, and uh, Corley Gillespie's estimate on the top sets uh, to be released uh, in the not too distant future, uh, but shortly after that. So with that, um, Mark, I'm going to turn it back to you for Q&A. That's very kind, David, Jay, Bob, Justin, thank you very much indeed for updating investors. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions. Using the Q&A tab on the right-hand corner of your screen, just simply type in your question and press send. But just while the guys take a few moments to review your question submitted already, I'd just like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with the copy of the slides and the published Q&A, will be available via your Investment Company dashboard. Uh, David, if I may just hand back to you, as you can see, you've had a number of questions submitted ahead of today's event and from uh, the attendance uh, today, which is very significant. Um, if I may just hand back to you, just to moderate through that Q&A where possible, take those questions and uh, give response where it's appropriate to do so. Certainly, thanks. Um, so one of the questions was what helium on Kodiak? Um, I think we addressed that in the um, uh, in, in the subsequent presentation. Uh, there are indications that there may be helium uh, that could be in commercial quantities, but absolutely no guarantee, no value taken for it, nor is it the basis for uh, investment. But uh, as soon as we had a potential market for uh, natural gas that would cause the helium to be uh, producible. Uh, we consider that to be price sensitive, uh, non-public information, and therefore we're obliged to, to share it. Um, second question, uh, what has the bondholder done with shares taken in payment on their uh, amortizations? Uh, Justin, can I hand that one to you? Yeah, sure, David. Look, the, the bondholder ultimately sells some or all of that stock, but they do it in a very measured way. And it's, it's a great question, and there's a lot of misunderstanding. They're not the big bad wolf, I think, that many expect. Um, they've been very supportive. In fact, what most shareholders don't know is that they've supported at an equity level um, all of our fundraisings since they've come in as an investor, including uh, the original uh, transaction where they came in and, and lent us money. Look, they lent $50 million unsecured um, it wasn't, they're not an equity holder, they're a lender, and they obviously need to manage their risk. That's their core competency. We've known that all along, and, and I've got to say to you, they've behaved incredibly well. We, we, couldn't be, we couldn't be more pleased with the way they do it, very professionally. They do hold a position um, at all times, is our understanding, and whenever we've asked the question, they've, they've always been very forthcoming in showing us that information. So, look, so ultimately, this bond, just so everybody understands, um, for the terms for Pantheon, we issue, you know, we borrowed $50 million, we paid that back over five years quarterly. So it's $2.5 million per quarter plus the interest. The interest is accruing at 4% coupon rate. I mean, it's, it, they're fantastic terms. We can pay that in, we can make those payments in cash at a quarterly, at quarterly or we can meet the, it, it through stock. And if we do it through stock, we do it at a 10% at a discount to essentially the VWAP of the stock price. So it's not a huge margin. What I would say, and, and what I really want to stress is that, is for shareholders, is that the bondholder makes their money if the stock really performs. They want to see the stock perform. Um, so today, for example, if we if we had to repay uh, a, a bond payment, it would be it would be, and we did it via stock. We would issue it at a ten percent discount to the VWAP in the period building up to uh, the payment date. Um, so, for example, if the share price was forty p and the, v, or the, v, the VWAP was 40p, we'd make that payment in stock at 36p. Now, what I would say to you is, is there is a, conver, a maximum conversion price, which is where the bondholder makes their money. If our stock price tripled overnight um, and we made a payment, well, then 
they would get all of the margin above that price, which is currently at about 91p, uh, so 91 cents US, so the, 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 the sterling equivalent of that, a little bit above 70p. So it's not until the stock reaches above 70p where they make their real margin. And of course, at that, at that point, we've got many ways of dealing with the bond if we want to minimise our cost of capital. We could go and raise equity at, 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 you know, if the stock went to a pound, we could raise equity at a pound and repay the stock. There's many ways we can do it. So, um, so yes, yeah, I hope that answers the question. So they always manage their position. That's the business that they do in the same way as a bank has to manage its risk position. It's, 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 an, un, um, it's an unsecured position and uh, they've been very professional in the way they do it. So I hope that answers the question, David. Thanks a lot, Justin. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a question. Do we expect uh, summer drilling? Uh, sorry, do we expect um, uh, to be drilling in the summer uh, season or the coming winter? Um, uh, Jay, we talked about four uh, wells, one in, in the east and, and uh, the others in the west. Uh, do you want to quickly talk about uh, about potential timing on that? Sure. Thank you, David. Sure, thank you, David. Thank you, David. Yeah, hang on. Yes, if you just leave your uh, microphone as it is, um, uh, Jay, and we'll keep through David's. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, yes. So it was it, good question. Subject of funding, obviously. Uh, it's unlikely we could get ready to drill a well this summer. Uh, all the all the work that that needs to go in advance of making sure we do that well as uh, any well as effectively and, and as inexpensively as possible. Uh, unlikely we could do that in the summer. A winter well, yes, we could be ready to drill a winter well subject to funding. Um, there is a lot more activity on the North Slope now with, with both ConocoPhillips and uh, the Santos uh, groups uh, uh, going full bore on their operations. And, and uh, of course, Hill Corp continuing to uh, recomplete wells at, at Prudhoe Bay and at Caparic. But yes, we, we could be drilling in the winter. We could do a second well then uh, after that in the spring or summer time frame. And if we had funding for two wells, one in, one, uh, in the west at, at, say, Pipeline State and one the Megrez well that Bob uh, outline to you. It'd be great to be able to do them back to back, and we'd love to do. Sorry, that. I think I think you meant if we had one uh, in Kodiak um, oh, uh, to okay, the west. Okay, sorry, okay. yeah, um, uh, up dip of, of theta west. But the um, uh, we the answer is uh, as Jay says, uh, we we can drill the uh, the eastern well from Megrez during the summer or winter. If it's cheaper to drill it in the summer, it would make sense to drill it in the summer. Um, whereas drilling out west um, uh, on Kodiak. Um, uh, it, it requires uh, an ice pad, so it's a winter a winter drill. Obviously, development drilling in Apuna and Kodiak uh, off on the tundra will be uh, on gravel pads. Um, there was a question about, can we talk more about the Kodiak development? Um, uh, we've, in, in terms of depths and, and stuff like that, um, uh, you, you can refer to the slides. Um, in terms of cost of the LNG project, um, uh, there was a question asked about that. Um, uh, that's not relevant to our specific situation, um, but the economics of an in-state gas pipeline um, uh, running down to South Central Alaska, providing half a billion cubic feet a day, uh, are attractive enough uh, for all the stakeholders involved to be negotiating in good faith to, to move that forward and, and uh, uh, to ensure that there is uh, no interruption in gas availability for uh, South Central Alaska. Um, uh, can we provide more information on the progress of our uh, federal um, applications and stuff? Uh, the, the work is ongoing. There's no, no particular update. Um, I can't provide specific commentary um, on on day-to-day -day work. Uh, we will update when there is anything significant to update. Um, the uh, but the work the the data is being gathered. The studies are being done, and and uh, uh, applications being prepared. Um, the uh, we talked about there were some questions about the vendor financing. I think I've talked about that, um, but just to be very clear, um, yes, we are currently in negotiations with only one company. Um, the uh, uh, we we were discussing with two. Now we're discussing with one. There's no uh, no hiding um, that that is what we said. Um, the 
Uh, I hope uh, the question about whether the uh, um, update at the end of March uh, on financing was substantive or not, um, I'm sure we can discuss what the word substantive means over a beer sometime, um, but uh, we do believe that it was significant in being able to demonstrate that uh, both from our side and from the other side of the discussion, uh, there was a meeting of, of minds on the, the outline of an agreement, and now we're working uh, both with the commercial stakeholders and the political stakeholders to turn that into something that works. Um, can I make Jay, one, can I make one yeah, comment yeah. from the subsurface point of view? The discussions with the state on the gas has moved gas from a liability to an asset, which was you know highlighted in the first slide, and it, it has massive impact in terms of our our valuations and things like that. And you know, when you talk about Apum, you, we can start talking about, you know, 2 billion barrels oil equivalent, where in the past, you know, f you know, handling 5 million, you know, 5 trillion cubic feet of gas, you know, with just injection, which is what our models still do, which is what we're still doing. But it just, it just fundamentally changes the whole dynamic of, of, of our project. Thanks, Bob. Um, the uh, um, Jay, maybe you can talk about how we would complete uh, wells, uh, because while the uh, you, you may not have as massive a, a, a completion, maybe you can talk a little bit about yeah. that. So the question was about, since we've talked of, that the uh, Kodiak West up dip and the Apoon East uh, top set, uh, are quote conventional, how would we complete them? And we we likely would drill either highly deviated wells, maybe partially uh, horizontal wells, but th the questioner said, would we need to put as large a frack on them? And the answer to that is no, they are conventional reservoirs. I would say that even in the conventional reservoirs that, that the legacy uh, uh, producers are completing. They do do small fracks on those to clean up around the well bore. How large a frack we put on, we would decide once we had, had taken logs and, and sidewall cores and, and hole cores, exactly how, how big a completion we needed. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Um, uh, Bob, um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the process that uh, Nettle and Sewell conducted. Um, the question was, did they make their own maps and do their own petrophysical analysis, et cetera, uh, or did they QC work done by Pantheon? But uh, I, I know there's more of a story there, so go ahead. So the answer to that question is yes and yes. So first they, you know, first they did QC the work that we've done, and then they, of course, went out and did their own analysis, and again, our, our numbers are different than their numbers, but because they've gone out and done their, their own analysis. Um, uh, they, they, one of the critical parts of the story was putting together the uh, analog at Tarn and Meltwater, which was uh, you know, a lot of work with, with them and, and our team collecting all that data and going through, and then they do their own analysis on that data and how to use it. So there's a lot of work that they do on their own uh, to come up with the results. Again, they spent a huge amount of time, the engineers spent a huge amount of time working out the, the, the liquids composition uh, of what we're gonna see at the surface, i.e. the oil versus the NGLs and, and condensate. And again, they did their own methodology for that. So some of the work, you know, it's pretty straightforward, you know, making the map, the structure maps and things like that. A lot of that straightforward QC, you know, they, they would, they would use it, um, you know, checking on the ice packs and doing some of their own work on the ice packs. Again, you know, some of that straightforward, but a lot of the interpretive work they did on the, uh, did on their own. Um, the, uh, uh, is the uh, upcoming uh, Apoon top sets going to include the Eastern top sets? The answer is no. That's a separate 
piece. And in any case, um, the resources in the Eastern top sets are prospective resources, not contingent resources. Uh, as Bob mentioned, 70% uh, geological chance of success. And there would be no point in, in spending a great deal of time and effort on an independent experts report until such time as we've got actual data in the reservoir. So uh, that's there. Uh, any plans to tie up with 88 Energy after the Hickory 1 discovery? Um, I think that's premature um, to be talking about that and, and it would require uh, both parties to think they wanted to tie up. Um, let's, let's wait and see how they get on with testing uh, the upper zone um, and, and then doing their analysis. Uh, and I'm sure they'll share that with their shareholders. It's not our job to, uh, to share 88 Energy's uh, analysis. Um, the upcoming uh, IERs, uh, we've asked both uh, Lee Keeling Associates and uh, Cordy Gillespie and Associates to include economics. Um, so yes, it will include uh, an assessment of the commerciality. Um, are we only aiming to get oil and gas production in 2028? Uh, no, we're aiming to get oil and gas production as quickly as possible. I, what I mentioned earlier was Kodiak um, certainly is not going to be getting its FID before 2028 um, and, and can't be coming into production before it gets its FID. Uh, we're working on plans to uh, minimize the cost and maximize or, and minimize the time frame uh, to, to maximize the potential for the earliest possible production um, from our leases. Uh, but as as that firms up, I'm sure we'll be updating people um, on on the timetable as it begins uh, uh, to firm up. Um, the uh, could the part of the bargaining process uh, with the state of Alaska mean access to taps uh, more quickly? No, that's a federal permit. Um, Department of Transport. Uh, tra De Department of Transport. Um, actually, it's a division of the Department of Transport called PHMSA, P H M S A, um, uh, which is the pipeline uh, uh, management uh, uh, agency in for, in that regard. Um, uh, can we give an overview of the timelines for the gas pipeline? Uh, I can only tell you what, what we understand to be the case, which is that they're aiming for an FID uh, during 2025. Um, the time to build a pipeline is between two and three years. Um, and uh, today they're trying to get uh, into a position to uh, fund the front end engineering and design studies uh, in order to be able to go out and uh, to be able to get to uh, uh, their FID. Uh, but it puts them in a similar um uh, timeline um to uh, to uh, our plans for having gas availability uh, from our fields um how does pantheon respond to people um asking questions about uh gas um uh, being needed uh, to be reinjected in the fields gas only needs to be reinjected in the fields um uh, in order to store it for for preservation for the state. Uh, it's not a part of our uh, production strategy. Uh, it's not required for that. Obviously, gas you, used in gas lift is recycled. Um, so it's not it's not that you use up gas in gas lift. Uh, we will be using gas, obviously, for uh, power generation, for running compression um, and drilling and, and uh, production operations. Um, how much do you think the uh, 2C estimate uh, for Kodiak can improve um, uh, with further drilling. Bob talked a bit about that. Um, uh, just, just to be clear, um, we're not suggesting that uh, we think that uh, Netherlands Sewell's assessment is wrong and that uh, we'll show them with further drilling. It is that the basis on which they've uh, assessed the mid case um, is one form of extrapolation from the data we have. The high case allows for a different form of extrapolation. Uh, our own analysis suggests that the different form of extrapolation may end up being validated by appraisal, which is why Bob said uh, earlier, our numbers are different from their numbers um, uh, because, because we've, we've come to a different interpretation. Uh, it doesn't mean we're unhappy with the work they're doing. Um, uh, in fact, we're pleased. Uh, to see that conservatism um, uh, and, and how commercial it looks, even using that uh, conservatism. Um, can we access the full extent of the eastern top set from uh, the Megrez location or, or from locations west of the river? Uh, the answer is that our um, assessment 
uh, is based, we, when we applied for the acreage, we looked to make sure that uh, we only applied for what could be reached from the west side of the river. Um, there may well be additional um, uh, commercial resource potential further to the west. Um, our view was that the costs of coming all the way down the other side of the Sag River um, uh, and, and trying to access it meant that there was little likelihood of that being a short-term target um, and, and that uh, we'd have plenty of time to, to think about what we wanted to do in terms of adding a different uh, additional acreage. Um, the, uh, uh, in terms of the probability that the gas deal with the state becomes a reality, uh, Bob was very bullish, uh, and this is important to us. Well, Bob is very bullish. It's important to us that Bob is bullish. Um, I suspect what you meant was that the gas deal might be important to us. The gas deal would certainly help us, um, uh, uh, but it's not the only basis on which we're able to move forward and develop these assets. Um, and so, uh, uh, but but how, how likely? Um, my experience is that when... You've got two parties who are motivated to do a deal because it's in their mutual interest to do so. Um, and the backstop for uh, one of those parties is either cold citizens or expensive LNG imports. Um, it would surprise me if we didn't uh, succeed in doing a deal. Uh, our interest is in making sure that uh, we deliver the maximum value uh, to the state in terms of uh, access to gas at afford on affordable terms, um, and we are certainly uh, open to to the proposals that have been made to us, um, and vice versa. So I, I'm optimistic on that. Um, would I move all the way from optimistic up to bullish? Um, no, I'll leave bullish to Bob. Um, I'll, I'll retain retain my stance as as merely optimistic at that uh, at this stage. Um, uh, uh, any updates on main uh, board and U.S. listing? Uh, I think we're rather than getting into the U.S. listing today, uh, we've always made clear that we our our process uh, is aimed at a U.S. listing in uh, around the end of the first quarter of 2025, so around a year from now. Um, that the basis for moving forward is to ensure that we uh, minimize any. Uh, potential friction, uh, particularly tax friction for investors from uh, wherever they are. Um, the uh, uh, but but it's highly unlikely that we would end up uh, still list listed on the aim um, uh, as uh, as a dual listing. It's possible that we'd be listed on the London Stock Exchange, and as I think Justin has has responded to various people, um, the uh, uh, you know. Many of us are shareholders with UK held shares, um, so so we're we're certainly not going to to be precipitous in the move. Uh, but but I think over the next couple of months we'll be uh, able to do a webinar that gets into the process in more detail. We hope to shortly uh, share with you who is uh, going to be our investment bank um, helping us through the process um, and and a more detailed outline on the process. Um, uh, the uh, uh, isn't the basic plan we don't need the state and this is just upside um the the answer is uh, of course we need the state and the state needs us uh, in so far as there are a number of approval approvals we require from the state and we are regulated by the state um uh, but the economics of the oil development do not rely upon a gas uh, project which i think is really what that question was about um and if this happens yes it's fabulous upside uh, but it's not. It's, it doesn't yet form any part of our planning basis um, uh, to assume that we do do a deal, um, and so we include all the injection wells that we might otherwise uh, have, have expected until such time as we don't. Um, the uh, someone said has the the exposure of the Pantheon story in the U.S. Uh, prompted um, meetings. Uh, the answer is we were meeting with U.S. investors before and we will continue meeting with U.S. investors, but there's no doubt at all um, that this, uh, the, the higher profile has has meant that we're talking with more people than, than otherwise we might have done. Um, the uh, 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 Mark, you seem to have deleted some of the questions. Uh, I'll, I'll try and remember some of the ones that you deleted. Um, uh, has uh, how do we feel about progress? 
we feel good about progress. But but we've said to you um, uh, six and nine months ago, we said an awful lot of what we do over the course of the next uh, two, three, four years is going to be the hard yards. It's the blocking and tackling, to use uh, an American football analogy. Um, it's not going to be sexy and a lot of it isn't going to be public, but it's all moving us forward to the point at which we've got a substantial development uh, project and, and we're bringing it on production. Um, and so we feel good that we are doing the work that needs to be done and that we're making forward progress. So uh, someone asked earlier how we'd grade ourselves. I think we're hard graders on ourselves. Um, we'd give ourselves and could do better in every regard right up until we deliver um, uh, the, the final result. Um, the uh, uh, vendor financing discussions are specific to uh, buying uh, goods and services from people, uh, regardless of whether they're related to oil, gas, or, or other uh, development. Um, uh, Offtaker uh, off financing is related to uh, production streams. Um, the how do we size uh, how does the size of pantheon's fields compare to global well i think a lot of you are, are aware of of the size of what we've said and and can uh, I, I would i can't believe i'm about to recommend wikipedia to you but wikipedia has a very good list of large oil fields around the world and you can you can see uh, how we compare um uh, do we expect equity and debt financing to be needed how does this relate to the US listing? Well, we've said we would definitely be doing a raise with the US listing because that's uh, there's a minimum level of raise uh, that you need to do in order to, to have an immediate uplist. Um, the, uh, we are, um, uh, in terms of the overall costs of getting to cash flow self-sufficiency, uh, we don't have any update on the numbers we've shared with you previously. Um, and, and so what is provided by debt won't be provided by equity and vice versa. Um, the, uh, our, our friend in uh, Huddersfield um, uh, says his divorce is getting closer um, uh, the, uh, and, and our price is rising. He's not sure which he's most ex uh, excited about. Um, the, uh, we're, we're excited for you if, you're, if your relationship means that divorce is, is uh, the right choice. Um, the, EURs and IRRs look spectacular. Um, the, uh, uh, I, I couldn't tell you how the returns compare to other operators. They, that's for them to share their numbers with you. Uh, but uh, we, we think they look spectacular as well in, in the sense of uh, they show that you've got very robust um, incremental drilling costs. Uh, if, you, if, if you wanted to come up with a post um, a federal tax uh, calculation, you could just knock off 21% uh, uh, from those values. Uh, they're still incredibly attractive. Um, these wells uh, are expected to pay back their costs um, in, uh, in around 12 months uh, or less. Uh, and that's the reason that the model just maxes out and says a rate of return higher than 100%. Um, once you get above 100%, actually, the calculation becomes slightly meaningless um, uh, because artifacts of the calculation can affect it. Um, are there other companies who could supply gas to the proposed pipeline? How close are they to the, uh, the proposed route? The answer is that the proposed route runs from Dead Horse down to uh, Nikiski. Um, and so that means basically anyone with gas on, on the North Slope is in a position to, uh, to supply gas. In terms of uh, at, at what timing and, and cost they could provide it. Uh, we are, as far as I'm aware, the only people who have uh, easy access to infrastructure uh, without the requirement for some kind of gas preconditioning to remove the carbon dioxide. Um, and, and certainly uh, we, are, uh, we have a competitive advantage in terms of uh, being further down the pipe. Um, uh why are the upper basin floor fan and the kaparik on the back burners well the kaparik's on the back burner uh because it's uh re relatively speaking a more expensive drill it was slightly over pressured um uh, which which has implications um and it's a it, it may well long term be a uh, an attractive reservoir but there's certainly nothing to be lost it's not it's not going anywhere i think uh, 
would be the way I, I describe it. In terms of the upper basin floor fan, uh, we expect to get more information uh, as we uh, as we drill. But it, again, it's not something that we need to appraise right now. If we drill development wells in in uh, Kodiak um, and we encounter an area where the upper basin floor fan is uh, well enough developed to complete it in its own right, we will. Um, and so in that regard, there's nothing to be gained by spending money uh, on, on further appraisal of the upper basin floor fan right now. Um, uh, the, uh, hang on, let's just see. Um, uh, what? Uh, how much of the fifty million? Oh, Justin, uh, j just to confirm, is it twenty-seven million dollars? Is is what's outstanding? Yeah, a little bit below twenty. A little bit below twenty-seven million dollars, David. That's correct. Yeah. Um, uh, once the IERs uh, are received, so we we publish the full IER as received. Um, uh, I know people have said that they were hoping for a, a, a beefier um, document from from Netherlands Sul. Um, we we play, put on the website the letter with it with its uh, schedules as as uh, as sent to us. Um, we typically don't think it's worth spending a lot of money to have an independent uh, report that regurgitates all of the nice coloured charts and stuff that you gave to them um, uh, back into uh, to, to bulk it out. Um, uh, we are. You know, it, it, the money's better spelt el spent elsewhere. Uh, we will publish everything that we receive from um, uh, from Lee Keeling and everything we receive from Corley Gillespie um, in whatever form. But but again, we have not asked them to do a big marketing document. We've asked them to do an analysis that uh, is used for helping people understand the value of the assets uh, for for uh, uh, partnership and and uh, 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 potential funding. Um, the uh, what would our potential share price be? Uh, that's not something we're in a position to answer. Um, we've told you what our target is, which is to demonstrate the sustainability of a five to ten dollar per barrel um, value of, of the uh, uh, established uh, uh, recovery uh, or expected ultimate recovery. Um, uh, what that means uh, for investors is is for them to make a decision. Someone asked about helium. I, I think, yes, you did arrive late. Um, uh, and and we, we talked about helium as being uh, an option that we ha we were obliged to disclose now that there was talk of the helium actually being uh, potentially brought to market rather than um, uh, re-injected. But we don't know in what concentrations it's there. All we know is that it was detected during the, uh, the Theta West well. Um, uh, we're progressing multiple strategies for funding, um, uh, whoever asked that. Um, and I think that is it, Mark. So with that, thank you all for participating and I'll hand it over to Mark to, for, for final. That's uh, very next. kind of you, David. Thank you. And thank you once again to everybody uh, for your engagement this afternoon, David, uh, Bob. Uh, Jay, Justin, thank you also for your time. Um, David, I'll shortly redirect everybody on the call to give you their feedback, their thoughts, their expectations. But I just wondered before doing so, just a couple of quick closing comments. And then, as I say, I'll send investors to give you some feedback. So in terms of, of uh, where we've uh, come from uh, and where we're going to, uh, I think you'll see that We've not made any transformational changes. We've simply refocused um, the strategy, uh, tightened our, our focus on what it is uh, that we're doing, um, and, and, and we're moving it forward. Uh, we're sorry if we're not exciting enough for some people. Uh, we think there's a lot going on over the coming months uh, with the uh, delivery of the additional in, uh, reports, with uh, progress on financing, with what we've talked about on the gas, with our neighbor's test result, um, and uh, beginning to plan uh, subject to funding for uh, uh, an exploration well on the eastern top sets uh, in, in what would be potentially a, a bringing a poon to a total of a billion barrels um, recoverable um, and uh, appraising with a view to pushing uh, the numbers up on uh, on Kodiak. So we, we thank you for having joined us for the ride so far. We hope you'll stay with us. Um, uh, certainly, uh, we, we all remain absolutely committed and focused to delivering our strategy.
That's great. David, Jay, Bob, Justin, thank you once again for your time this afternoon. Companies ask investors not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. This only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure it'll be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Pantheon Resources PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.